the forest is not just trees, it's a whole. The rock, the forest, everything is intertwined. And the relationship between people and forest has been the center of my life for the last decades. My life into the forest was a journey. It didn't start there, but it passed through that, and now it is there. There we are, in the forest, in this strange space, filled with mysteries and magic, shadows and light, knowledge and life. A territory through which Milagri Nuvunga traveled for a long time before making it her home and taking root there. Milagri's story starts and ends in Mozambique, but it takes us through the forests in Brazil, Uganda, Cuba. It's a journey to the relationship between the trees and the people. It also takes us through love, legends, and how spiritual connections with holy places in rainforests have shaped history for centuries, much before colonialism and before the borders of the countries in Southern Africa as we know them. You are listening to Wild Basil, the podcast that tells the stories of some heroes that are changing the narrative of a region. This episode is about Milagre. Her name in Portuguese means miracle. And that's perhaps why she's so attentive to extraordinary tales and always ready to join them. One of the first things that we did when we arrived in uh, Manica province in 2008 was travel looking for the most important cultural and archaeological sites. Well, we talked to the community and we said, Okay, uh, let's work together in finding a site that could be the place where we could have a lodge, a community lodge. And when they finally understood what we wanted, we went to a place where Enzo Camp is now, which is between two sacred sites. And they told us the story of the place. And it was a story uh, of uh, a young boy who disappeared from the village. It's only when he came back much later, older and wiser, with a lot of knowledge of the forest around, but also of all the important plants that exist in the area. He came back with this knowledge and he became a healer as well. And they realized that there was a huge cave where he said he had disappeared into and where he got this knowledge. And they believe their ancestors had hidden that knowledge under in that cave under this big rock. And uh, for me, when I go to Zorokam, it is a sense of being in a blessed space and having this place there. It is a sense of wonder. Nzu Camp is at the heart of the Mikaya Foundation, the last adventure of Milagri, maybe. This wonder is set in the middle of the Maribani Forest Reserve, lost in the mountains of Shimanimani, on the borders between Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Nzu means elephant, and Nzu Camp is a place dedicated to education and learning, and is pleasantly shaded by trees, as Milagri's life started. Thinking why I'm in this space today, and also thinking that nothing happens um, per chance, I thought back into my childhood and uh, when I was in primary school and what I used to do, where I felt best and free. Um, I was a little bit of a tomboy always and um, I liked to be outdoors playing uh, with boys, but most of all climbing trees. I was um, in Villa Paiva de Andrade then, which is now Villa de Gorongosa. It was this idyllic, really, really beautiful little garden village. And I would pick up a book, go find a place high up in the tree, sit there eating a mango or eating a guava, whatever was in season. And I would be reading this. And so I felt good there in the tree where nobody could see me, even if they were standing down at the bottom of the tree to look up, they wouldn't see me because of the foliage. 
Sometimes I would fall off because a snake would uh, jump and fall on my foot. I would get startled and fall with it. So trees have been a very critical, I mean, always present in my life one way or another. And they've always been a place where I went to be with myself, by myself, doing whatever I wanted to do. If Milagri saves space with trees, now imagine how magical it was when she met the forest. I went to Gorongosa when I was four. And I would say that that was my first encounter with the forest, Gorongosa National Park. And uh, I didn't even need to go into the park to see the animals. I mean, the cars would go through almost like a gallery, a tunnel of trees. And very often we'd have to stop to let the animals go. Could be buffaloes, could be elephants, could be anything in this thick forest we had to drive by. Gorongosa's story is a turbulent one. The Gorongosa National Park was established by the Portuguese colony in the 60s. The area was pristine, but the country's 30 years of conflict destroyed the area. For the last decade, a new investment in the park is reverting history and showing the force of nature to come back even from the brink of extirpation. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Milagri wasn't yet interested in conservation. Milagri's vocation was not written from childhood. It is, as often in good stories, the result of an accident. I never thought that I would be working as a forester. I wanted to work as a medical doctor, actually. And uh, maybe because being a medical doctor was a glamorous profession. But uh, that's what I had in mind. It's, I grew up with that. But I was doing my secondary school in Beta. And the uh, government made a decision to intervene, mostly because we needed to have professionals, Mozambican professionals, trained fast. The then president, Samora Michel, in a famous uh, speech on the 8th of March, That's why I'm from the Oito de Marzo generation, 8th of March generation. He declared that all the last two years of secondary school would stop and everybody taken out for one year of pre-university training, intensive year of pre-university training. And then all of us will be sent to different places according to the priorities that were decided by the government as critical to uphold the economy of the country. And so boys and girls found themselves being uh, teachers and girls uh, doing engineering. And so it was just a list of names, not by gender or anything. And that's how I found my name in the agriculture (laughs) list. The Portuguese colonial system did not invest in Mozambique. It extracted the land's resources. At independence in 75, nearly 95% of the population was illiterate. So between this and the exodus of over 200,000 Portuguese who feared the Frelimo Marxist-Leninist policies, there were hardly any skills left. Shortly after independence, the country counted about 80 doctors. And that was a case for almost all professions. What were the options? Milagri was part of the generation enrolled to build the nation. They had no alternative. I thought it was a curse when it happened. (laughs) But um, today, I think it's the best thing that could have happened to me. It was such a departure from what I thought I wanted to do with my life that I think I spent a week crying. I thought... I wanted to deal with people, actually not with trees and soil and potatoes and things like that. But then uh, two years later, as I was doing agriculture, the forest faculty opened and I had the right credits to then move into forestry. So when they asked for volunteers, I was one of the six who chose to do forestry. Again, the trees were an escape for Milagri. We can't usually choose the cards we are dealt with, but we can choose how to play them. And Milagri got into the game. 
So Milagri resolutely climbed that tree to the top. After a number of years of working in the ministry, I became a national director for forestry and wildlife. When I became national director for forestry and wildlife, I was the first female in that position in Africa. I didn't know that, and I know it was not by design either, but in all the international meetings I had to go to throughout that time, I was the only woman holding that position in the continent. That was in 1992, which also coincided with um, the end of the civil war in Mozambique. 1992 was also an important milestone for environmentalists. It was the first World Earth Summit. I remember, I was a kid. All the nations of the world met in Rio de Janeiro to discuss the environment. Mozambique, however, was busy finalizing its peace accords. After more than a decade of a particularly savage civil war between the Frelimo government and the Renamo guerrilla movement, peace was signed in October 92. During the years of conflict, more than a third of the country population fled, seeking refuge, mainly in the surrounding nations. Animals were all killed. But the forest blossomed. So we would fly into these uh, neighboring countries that had lived in peace for a number of years and we would see the deforestation rate in those countries and would fly into Mozambique. We knew immediately when we were flying into Mozambique because it was so green. And uh, that was a sense of pride. Not the reason why, of course, but uh, just the forest in me would feel that pride of, okay, this is Mozambique. Look at how green it is. Look at how beautiful it is. So that was, uh, I think, an important moment in my life, a moment of reconnection with the forest, although sad because people, I mean, the majority were displaced. But because the forests and the parks were devoid of people, people had to flee for their lives, the forest recovered. It was forests everywhere, but animals were gone. In the forest where those animals once lived, we would only find the bones of the animals that were slaughtered to feed the warring fashions that way. It was difficult to feed the soldiers and they had to fend for themselves. And the national parks and reserves were the places where food came more easily to people. Some talk about the miracle of Mozambique, when almost overnight refugees started returning home. At first, spontaneously. Help came later. In the two, three years that followed, 1.7 million people came back by foot, ferry, buses, cars, planes, and an estimated 4 million internally displaced persons emerged from their hiding places. Because of the peace accord, people began coming back from the neighboring countries into Mozambique. And so those green spaces were very rapidly becoming brown by necessity. The villages that had been abandoned, that had become reforested, people were going back, they were cutting faster to rebuild their lives. Of course, there were many people taking advantage of the situation. People uh, from uh, the city who had businesses and uh, they could go into the forest and extract. So it was a very difficult moment because we had legislation, but it was very difficult to enforce legislation on people who had lost everything. There are no books or theories that can teach you how to deal with this situation. The law was developed to protect the environment and it was Milagri's job and pride to be responsible for the forests. On the other hand, a third of your country is coming back after 30 years of conflict. And between the cracks, corruption is creeping in like a bad vine. What would you do if you had, like Milagri, to find an equilibrium between nature and people? I felt that part of my duty 
was maybe just ensure that people knew. First, to respect the fact that people needed to rebuild their lives. And that meant that some leeway needed to be given to them to do that so that they could survive. Because for me, it's not a forest versus people and a choice to be made for one or the other. For me, it's about how they can live together. It's, it's a give and take on both sides. In 1994, I began feeling a shift. We embraced democracy and people were in this young democracy. They were discovering different ways of making money fast. And nothing easier than the forestry and wildlife department where just with a, a chainsaw you could cut so much timber and make money so fast without much investment. You would arm a few people with chainsaws and uh, an old truck would be enough for you to take all the riches of the forest. And so I felt as if I was in the front line of that new greed that was coming out of this opening and people were finding new, new opportunities and forestry and wildlife where the cheap, easy wins. It took just one year from 94 to 95 of all that pressure for me to feel that the balance was shifting too fast. Then I felt maybe powerless, not because I didn't have the power to do what was right, but also um, because I, I felt that my energy was being uh, just fighting fires, uh, used in ways that were not constructive. I felt I didn't have the experience then to fight the tide. So I felt more like a, like a policeman than a forester. So that was not what I wanted to do. That's why I left. And I had this opportunity to join the United Nations. Milagri that was told she could not choose what she was going to study, that was handed over the responsibility to take care of the forest of an entirely new country. She was at a crossroads. Should she continue to serve her country, despite the barriers that made her life impossible? Or should she live? Again, she decided to boldly climb and keep her principles. When I was national director, I used to talk about the difficulties I, I was facing and how challenged I was feeling in dealing with rising corruption and uh, how that was really making my life miserable. <laughs> and so a Brazilian lady who worked at the UN here in Mozambique said, OK, have you heard of this position that the UN has put forward? And she said, well, you are as qualified as any man or woman who might put themselves forward. Just do it. <laughs> that was the first job interview of my life. <laughs> and I never had a suit in my life or anything excessively formal. And well, I made it through the, the different stages and I got the job. I was a single mother of two primary school kids, and I was offered the job for a year. It was a one-year contract. And I was like, okay, what will I do? Uh, am I just going by myself? And uh, it was a difficult decision, but I just decided to take them with me. And luckily, my youngest sister, my sister number eight, <laughs> Mariana, uh, she decided that she wanted to come with me. My job as a program officer in this particular department entailed a lot of travel. And although there were challenges everywhere, the one that marked me the most was my relationship with Cuba. Of course, Mozambique has and had a long history with Cuba, with the revolution and everything else. But going to Cuba and working sometimes two weeks in a row with Cuban foresters, dedicated Cuban foresters, they made me feel like the forester I was. And there I didn't feel like I was coming from the United Nations and I couldn't stick to my role as somebody who was just there with a fund to support the process. They took me not just to the forest, they took me 
to far flung, flung places in highlands somewhere in the middle of nowhere where some of the retired foresters had decided to stay. And we would spend a night with them discussing these issues, drinking knowledge from them to then see if we could make sense of that and in the formats that we had from the UN, how to bring all of that into there and uh, put that in the format of this particular fund. But it didn't end there. We were faced with uh, politics because this was Cuba and, and the relationship between Cuba and the US were very strained. And it was the most difficult program to get past. When it was presented, it was not accepted. It was denied. It said, this is not going to be funded. And I went, no, that cannot happen. Those people need these funds more than anybody else I know. I was no longer a program uh, officer. I became an activist. I just picked that up and I said, okay, who said no? Where do these papers go when they leave my desk? I want to go there. And I went there. I went higher and higher and higher. And I found myself in front of three, four big people. And in the end, I was crying. But I said, this has to pass. You cannot stop this. You cannot. You do not have the right. You do not have, I mean, under no grounds. And it passed. Cuba was one of the strongest allies of Mozambique during the first years of independence. A couple of islands in Cuba were even handed over to Mozambique to open schools for children to be able to study in a peaceful land. The same way that in the 80s, students in last year of high school went to university, students in the first year of high school were sent to Cuba. But this is a fascinating story of another generation, maybe for another podcast. For now, Milagres is in New York, and her live senior tree offered her again a new branch. When I went to the UN, I went with a contract of one year. But then I ended up not only staying three years, and I handed in my resignation because I was asked by the then Minister of Environment of this newly created Ministry of Environment in Mozambique, uh, Bernardo Ferraz, to come back and join his team. Uh, Milagro, you left at the wrong moment. You should uh, come back. We, we now have a Ministry of Environment. All of these issues that we used to discuss in the Grupo de Trabalho Ambiental, we can now do it within the setting of a ministry. We have the mandate to do that. So I came back and they requested that I become the National Director for Natural Resources Management within the ministry. But after a while, I... I began seeing some signs of uh, the issues around corruption um, in the country had just taken different forms and different contours. And uh, it was still a very difficult space to navigate. If the story of conservation requires an equilibrium, the 90s in Mozambique was like tightrope walking. Ups on one side with some incredible commitments and lows on the other taking advantage of the treasures and wealth provided by the natural resources of the country to enrich just a few. You would see truckloads and truckloads of valuable timber lining the port of Maputo and knowing that it was illegal, that it didn't have the papers. So Mozambique as a country was losing through all of that and nothing was being done to stop those who were intent of, well, using illegal means to become rich or to deal with forestry and wildlife resources, they were using that time to really hype up their activities, either by taking more timber out and uh, taking more um, uh, like rhino horns or whatever, uh, whatever the market was paying. And uh, uh, we saw a hype on those activities as well. Uh, I could choose to spend my life being working with rangers and whatever and chasing, but I've always wanted to do positive things. 
or shine a light on the positive things so that more people could find inspiration on them. I knew of courageous stories of people who put themselves on the line to catch corrupt officials in the private sector, in government and NGOs, because, of course, corrupt people, they are everywhere, wherever they choose to be. But I wanted to see how things could be done better. And then maybe by highlighting them, make sure that more people saw them. And instead of being called by the bad side, they could be called to do good. If this doing good meant you can also make money and be rich doing good, then maybe they would also come and embrace that side. So that has been my leaning throughout. And as director for natural resources management, I would be in the same position I, I, I was before with all that entailed and I wouldn't be effective again. And so, again, I wasn't really ready for that, so I handed in my resignation. At this precise moment in her history, Milagri realized that if the profiteers and other traffickers were trying to sow off the trees of Mozambique natural wealth at the base, and that many of the branches were already rooting, it was better for her again to change of perspective, go elsewhere, to continue to fight effectively for her dear forests. And the Ford Foundation provided that opportunity. I joined the Ford Foundation in January 2002. I was somewhere in Lapland, in Sweden, when I was called from the Ford Foundation in New York. And I flew to Nairobi. This was to be the uh, program officer again in the Ford Foundation regional office in East Africa, covering Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda, but based in Nairobi. So I decided to make in conservation work for poor natural resource dependent communities. And that's what guided my work in East Africa. So my entry point were local communities that lived mostly in the buffer zones of conservation areas because they were the ones whose lives were more constrained. To make a difference, familiarity with the summits is not always enough. Sometimes you even lose sight of reality, that of the field. And that's how Milagri came back down to get closer to the ground and the action on the pitch. Closer to people. When the conservation sector thinks about natural parks and reserves and corridors, it's easier to do it when there are no people in those areas or around it. It's not the urban dwellers that will be touched by those changes, at least not directly. It's the communities living in and around the parks. With an Africa 2.5 billion people, those communities will grow. And the solution cannot be sustainable without including and making sense for them. As Milagri discovered. If I now go to the experience that marked me the most, I think uh, I have one that actually not only made me cry, but made me feel ill. Uh, Isipe which is the International Center for Insect Physiology and Entomology, invited me to go to Uganda, to the Mukahinga Park, where they have gorillas. As I was arriving at the town where we were going to be based, I looked at the mountains and I saw a lot of color in what was a beautiful uh, agricultural landscape. There, there were little piles of plastic strewn on the mountains, and they said, those are the houses of the Batwa people. So the Batwa is a pygmy community, and they used to live in these Gahinga hills that now became a park. Okay, and, and why are they now in those plastic bags? Well, that's all they can afford. And why is that? <laughs> well, they had to come out of the mountains so that that could be left just for the gorillas. I said, okay. And there's, there's so much uh, money around for the conservation of the gorillas. Why are they living in these conditions? Can I also ask you to organize for me to meet one or two of the Batwa families? And they said, okay, they organized that. And I went and talked to a family. A family accepted to talk to us and explain their story. 
And I think it had been 40 years since they, they had left the mountains. And they were telling me how grateful they were that they were given this little place where they could use this plastic that they got from the supermarkets to uh, turn them into their houses because the owners of those fields gave them this little plot. I mean, they were working in the field and their payment was to have that little space for them to sleep in their fields. And sometimes they were given some traditional brew. And uh, I talked to some others later on when they were drunk, they would say, oh, I am worthless, or I am this, or I am that, repeating what people said they were. That was a bit hard to take as well, because a lot of abuse was happening to get them to that space where they would tell me that. And so I asked to pay to go and see the gorillas as well. So I went, I was very lucky that within one hour of walking, we found the gorillas. And then we were standing Then they say, well, okay, uh, John over there is the silverback. And John had um, fever last week. Mary over there, she had uh, diarrhea. Or little Peter here had, and I was like, there's something very wrong here. The people that left this place to make room for this conservation to happen, nobody knows their names or where they are. The gorillas, I'm not diminishing all the challenges the species has had, but it's the balance that was wrong, totally wrong. Something really burst inside and I had to crouch. I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I said, okay, uh, I think I've seen enough. Can you take me back, please? And they had to take me straight to the doctor, actually. And that got me thinking of what uh, could be wrong with conservation as well. This story summarizes painfully one of the most thorny challenges of conservation. Love is not a solution for everything, but it helps a lot. And it gives one strength. It gave a new start and courage to Milagri. I think one way or the other, love for one thing or love for uh, our children or love for nature, love for people and communities. I think it's a permanent ingredient. (laughs) But um, in this case, falling in love with Andrew, I guess, meant that there was a different dimension in my life that uh, could enable me to look at coming back to Mozambique to try a different position. So we decided then that, okay, if we were to go back to Mozambique, How could our combined experiences make most impact? What was it I could do which would not put me directly in contact with what I dreaded the most? What could I do? So we thought maybe if we do something that's very localized, really be part of a community and grow from there, just turn ourselves into little seeds that nobody will be able to see at first. And that could uh, enable us to then start growing and growing roots and become strong enough so that when we were visible enough, we would have learned a lot about our environment and about ways in which we could be more effective. And so then, uh, as I am a Mozambican forester, I came up uh, with this word, Mikaya. Mikaya is unique in Mozambique. They support a series of non-timber value chains, as well as community-based tourism, with an intelligent mix of social private sector and community models. And it's starting to see real impact and create ripples of change from the bottom up, led by the people. And the name is powerful, like the mother tree in the heart of a forest. What is Mikaya? Mikaya is the term we have for any thorny acacia. Kaya in Southern Mozambican languages means home. Mikaya also uh, made us think of Mikasa, like my home in Spanish or whatever related Latin languages. It also made us think about Gaia, 
Mother Earth. And the fact of being thorny also meant that we could be small or a small Micaiah or a big Micaiah. We had core values that we were going to abide by. And the fact that it was a tree also, that was important. Wild Basil, a podcast produced by Mova. Written by Luiz Guimarães Scherer Navarro and Martin Kennan. Music by Carson Mucavelli. Historical advisor, Stephanie Erdang. Scientific advisor, Gislain Rib. Recording. Carson Studio Maputo, directed by Martin Kennan. Funded by AFD. Find us on movamoz.co.mz.